And now we've come to our final, final award, the second annual Spirit of Service Award, which recognizes individuals outside the federal workforce who have made significant contributions to public service and the public good, either by helping government be more innovative and effective, or by advocating for effective government and those who serve. Following the award presentation, we will hold a fireside chat moderated by former Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker. Penny Pritzker served in the cabinet position for three and a half years during the Obama administration after a long and distinguished career in the private sector. Secretary Pritzker is also the founder and chairman of the investment firm PSP, PSP Partners, where she continues to lead as an entrepreneur, business builder, philanthropist, and civic leader, including her service on numerous business and nonprofit boards and civic initiatives. But first, here to present the 2019 Spirit of Service Award, please welcome back to the stage National Security and International Affairs Award winner, Ryan Shelby. Thank you all. Now, some of you may have heard of our final award winner. Now, if you're from New York, you may know him as a three-term mayor who led New York's post-9-11 recovery, improved public schools, expanded public parks, cut crime, and launched ambitious public health initiatives. Now, if you're from the Baltimore, Washington area, you may know him as a generous benefactor of his alma mater, John Hopkins University, to which Mayor Bloomberg recently gave $1.8 billion entirely for financial aid, folks, so that no student, and I mean no student, will be turned away because of their financial situation. That's amazing. His gift is the largest gift in the history of American higher education. Now, if you've been involved in disaster relief efforts in the Caribbean, as I have, you may know the significant role that he and his foundation played in 2017 delivering emergency supplies to the U.S. Virgin Islands when two Category 5 storms blasted the islands within 12 days of each other. Mayor Bloomberg and his team were able to provide valuable assistance based off of their recovery and rebuilding experience after Hurricane Sandy engulfed the Northeast U.S. in 2012. Now, if you haven't figured it out, the mayor is passionate about finding and implementing solutions to tough problems. So I think he's a really an engineer just in hiding, so, which is great. We love him. Now, in particular, his philanthropic contributions have supported initiatives such as combating the nation's opioid crisis and reducing e-cigarette usage amongst children. Through his foundation, Bluebird Philanthropies, he's given away $8.2 billion in the fields of education, public health, the environment, the arts, and government innovation. Now, most pertinent to this evening's celebration, he's made a unique commitment to helping governments work better by providing financial and technical support to foster innovative management practices. The foundation's grants help local governments collaborate with the private sector and nonprofit partners, as well as identify and track results, and finally, use that data to address significant urban challenges. Now, as Mayor Bloomberg recently wrote, neither his foundation nor similar organizations can replace decisive action by the federal government to meet our nation's challenges. But those organizations can spur progress from the bottom up. Philanthropy can help groups and governments already taking actions to do it better and to do more and to do it fat faster. Now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to present the 2019 Service of America Medal Spirit of Service Award to someone who has demonstrated a deep commitment to public service and has made a positive and lasting difference in the lives of the people around the world. Now, everyone, please join me in congratulating Mr. Michael Bloomberg.
Good evening, everyone. Penny? Mayor, congratulations. Thank you. Fantastic. You know, it's a great honor to be here tonight to celebrate the career professionals that make our government run every day and provide essential services throughout our country. And well, you I, worked for the government and did an awful lot. Thank you for your service. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. appreciate that. But I, you know, I think I can speak for both of us. We're profoundly grateful to the yes. men and women who we've honored here tonight and those of all of who are here today working in our federal government. You know, Mayor Bloomberg, it's great to be able to share this evening with you as you are um, uh, receive this Spirit of Service Award. Um, you know, I consider you a friend and a mentor, and you've always generously shared with me uh, lessons about how to manage in government and in the private sector, and I want to thank you for that. Um, you're a true innovator um, in the areas of business and government and philanthropy, and very few people have done that in all three arenas. You know, your cutting edge ideas um, have reinvented the way that uh, the financial services sector works. You've also reinvented the way that we receive information about our economy. Um, when you were elected mayor, you took over at a time after a devastating tragedy in New York of 9-11, and you made the city better than ever. Uh, and then you redefined philanthropy, focusing on helping cities and uh, really taking on the tough issues of how do we uh, address uh, gun control and gun violence in our cities and our country, and then taking on the existential crisis of climate change. So, wow, really thank you for everything that well, you've thank you. done. Thank you, everyone. So let's begin the conversation and talk a little bit about leadership. Tell us, all of us here want to know, you've led in, as I said, the private sector, in government, in philanthropy. You know, it, talk about the key things we should know about leadership. Well, you have to lead by example. If I'm going to work late, I expect you to work late. But if I expect you to work late, I better do it myself as well. You have to be able to delegate um, and give people authority to go along with responsibility. And then you have to have new ideas and give people credit for what they did, even if it was you. If you say, Mike, I did something. OK, I know you did it. If you say, Mike, here's the team that did it, and I was lucky enough to work with them, two things happen. Number one, I know you did it. And number two, I appreciate your willingness to delegate authority, to go along with responsibility, and to give people what they want, recognition and respect. And people often ask me, what's the difference between government and business? And I always say, well, business is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and government is just the reverse. <laughs> and then I wait to see how long the crowd takes before they laugh. <laughs> sort of B-plus here. Ooh. But seriously, we all want recognition and respect. And if you want to make a lot of money, the recognition is not going to come if you become a school teacher. On the other hand, if you want to be self, get some satisfaction of really changing the world, you could be a fifth grade teacher and the kid that you teach may go on as she or he to cure cancer. And you were really part of that process. But we all want to know that people appreciate what we do and that they have the opportunity to shine. And also, if they don't, if it doesn't work out, that you have their backs. Our police department always has this expression, <laughs> He had my back when I was the mayor. And that's something that lets you have the freedom to take risks and to be innovative and to say what you want, to be uh, open and say, hey, uh, boss, you don't have any clothes on. Before you go out there, let me tell you what you should do. <laughs> and I think if we don't have somebody like that in our lives, we can't really be successful. I have a, a team, Patty Harris and Kevin Sheikey, or two of them are here and a couple of others with them. And I'll say to them, I'm going to do this. And they say, no, you're not. I say, I'm going to do it. No, you're not. Look, I'm the mayor or the boss. I'm going to do it. They walk out. Then each comes to see me separately. You can't do it. I'm just telling you, you can't do it. I'm going to do it. You can't do it. And then I finally storm out, and I get back to my desk, and they've taken away my keyboard and telephone. <laughs> and it's that kind of, you have to have people that tell you when you're making a mistake. You can't do it. You can't, you're not, 
my strength has never been that I was the smartest person in the room. The only thing that I have going for me is I can outwork anybody, or at least nobody can outwork me. Mm -hmm. we, you can join me 24-7, but you're not going to get 25-7. and seven. Yeah. And so um, putting the, the elbow grease in is, is also part of it. So you wrote an op-ed today in the Washington Post, um, and in it you said, and I'm going to quote you, the fact is a legislative proposal is only as good as the execution plan that accompanies it, and that candidates can promise the whole loaf, but executives need to figure out how to get at least half. So tell us about how you approach the implementation of big policy uh, during your term as, gov as uh, mayor and, you know, in your life? Well, um, if you take a look at the candidates that are running for office today, they all have some ideas. Um, all of those ideas came from their staffs, experts, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I never hear any of them say how they are going to implement it. If I'm president, I'm going to do this. I don't know how to explain to them that you just can't go out and just do it, although maybe we're, our current president is changing those rules a little <laughs> bit. But it's, you have to be able to implement. The president's job, the governor's job, the mayor's job, the, the head of the hospital and the, your place of worship and your school and your company, those are management jobs. And strength of the organization, whether it's a government or a private sector one, the people that are out there in the trenches doing the work. Management is not something you learn by reading a book. Mm -hmm. You can't read a book on skiing and go out and ski double black diamonds. You can't go and manage something by just walking in at the top and say, you do this, you do this. That's, that's a prescription for disaster. And unfortunately, we elect people who have never had management experience. Mm -hmm. They've gotten there because Somebody says, oh, I have confidence in her or him, or I just think they'll be good, or I don't like the other person. But the President of the United States manages 4 million people. Now, there's no ways anybody who's going to get elected President of the United States have, will come with the experience of managing 4 million people. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't managed anybody, you're really starting way behind the eight ball. <laughs> Uh, I'll never forget the first time I had to lay somebody off. Mm -hmm. And I agonized and I stalled for a week and my boss kept saying, you gotta go do it. And finally I got the courage to do it, but I walked into the room thinking, this person is going to lose his ability to feed his family. But there was just no choice. He was not up to the job. We'd worked with him and that sort of thing. He wasn't gonna work out. And then later on I had to lay off five people. And then you slowly build into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that experience, you're not going to get anything done. And I worry about all these programs that we keep getting promised every single election, and they never appear. And they never appear because they're not well thought out of how you're going to implement them, what the political implications are, where's the money going to come from, what other things can get in the way. If I promise you more things than we can possibly do, we just can't deliver them all. Right. In fact, I'm probably not going to deliver any of them. And that's why the people that are represented in this room, or by the people in this room, are really so important. Uh, There's a guy, Michael Lewis, who writes for Bloomberg and has written a number of good books, and he wrote another book recently, The Fifth Risk. The Fifth Risk was about the bureaucracy, and he made the case that the bureaucracy slows things down and doesn't take enough, uh, is not innovative enough and that sort of thing. And I got up at the end of the book party and I said, well, Michael, thank you, it's a great book and that sort of thing, but just remember, that bureaucracy is our insurance policy against elected officials doing stupid things. And that really is the case. The, the Founding Fathers had the idea that the Electoral College would do that. But the Electoral College doesn't function that way. We all know the Electoral College is basically going to vote the way the public says. It's not going to overrule the public. But the bureaucracy, with deep knowledge of how things work, and the knowledge that they are going to be there longer than any elected official, they're the ones that can really put it gating on things we shouldn't do and push the things we should do. And they're not going to do it right every time. And I think one of the things that worries me the most after ten listening tonight, if only 6% of the people in the government are under 30, uh, what are we, where are the engineers we know that modern-day technology 
We need young people. We've somehow or other got to get young people to come into government. So let me, let me, let me ask you a little bit more about that. You have been very successful in your businesses and in government in attracting talent and attracting young talent, people who are excited to work for you. You know, how do you do that? And what do we need to be doing in our federal government to get more young people to come in and participate and recognize the great op opportunities that exist? Well, at, at Bloomberg, I give virtually all the company's profits to the Bloomberg Foundation, and we're giving it away. I've got enough money to live. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very OK for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I'd like to do something with I'm all the money. I'm not worried about you. I know. <laughs> but when we come to your school and we try to recruit you, we say, Penny, you go to work for big company X. You're going to make a bunch of stockholders richer. You come to work for Bloomberg, you're going to generate the funds that are going to go to cure cancer and wipe out malaria and educate kids and going right down the list, help the arts and the environment and all the things we do. That is a very powerful thing in this day and age in recruiting. Mm -hmm. Young people want to be part of the solution, if you will. Now, let's not get too carried away because when they get out there and they want a bigger apartment, they're going to start turning. They all turn from very left wing to sort of middle of the road, and some even get to be conservative. Mm -hmm. But it is that, that youth and that enthusiasm and giving them opportunities to do things is one of the reasons they come to work for our company. And one of the reasons they stay is we give them things to do where they can see that they're making progress. Mm -hmm. And I hear it all the time when somebody comes to us from another company, oh, I was just a cog in the wheel, but here, I'm really working on this project and I know what it's gonna do. Mm -hmm. And we give them responsibility. You're gonna cover these accounts. You really can help those people at that account. You can help them, not only can you sell them the things we wanna sell them, but you can be proud of they're gonna use them to help themselves and their stockholders. So there's some things you can do to get people interested. And then you just have to treat people well. I mean, I'm a big believer in having a, a, a open plan so that they can walk around and talk to everybody. And I try to talk to a lot of the people in the company. I'll walk down the aisle and I'll see you have some food on your plate and I'll reach over and just take a, a <laughs> green bean and just eat it. And you go home and you say, you know, Mike stopped by my desk. He took a green bean off my plate or something. Who's Mike? I mean, Mike Bloomberg? You know Mike Bloomberg? You talk to him? And that goes a long ways. Well, if somebody I, in our company, we have 20,000 people, if somebody in their family dies, I call right away. And it's those little things that get people to say this is a special place. Well, I've seen you in action in that respect, both in your office and at Bloomberg and also in the mayor's office. You had your bullpen, you had everyone around right you. Right in the middle. And people knew what was going on. Yes. And they really felt that they were a what part of something. What also is true, we never had leaks. In 12 years in City Hall, you can... Count on your hit one hand the number of times there was an article in the paper, an unnamed source who wasn't authorized to speak said, this is what's going on in the Bloomberg administration. Why? Because they all felt part of it. In an open plan, they all felt that they were equal and it was them and they didn't want to hurt that. It wasn't the other people they were going after. You know, I've gotten to see in many different respects, you're a very hands-on leader. You give really clear direction and um, you have an extraordinary attention for detail. Uh, we did the- That's called micromanaging. Yeah. <laughs> I'm calling it attention <laughs> to detail for tonight. Uh, and you've accomplished a lot of good in your life. And, you know, as oh, we you. talked about, uh, as mayor, all the great things that you did. You balanced the budget for the first time in modern history in New York City. Um, you know, you passed a groundbreaking law about public smoking banning public smoking that became basically the standard for the rest of I the I got country. a lot of one-finger waves for that in parades. I'll tell you what, public health. We talked about your foundation and all the incredible things that you did, you've done with your foundation as it relates to climate change, as it relates to helping governors and other people in government um, and working on really tough gun safety regulations. So, so now what? You do not strike me like a guy who's done. So what, what's your next act? Well, I, I spend, I go to the office every day. Mm -hmm. I have focused uh, in the last two years on succession and building a management team. I'm just appointed, I took our management committee, which was three people, three guys in their 70s to um, 
Now it's seven people, two women, uh, four of them are in their 50s or lower, and trying to get ready for the next generation. We all talk about that, and then we die and haven't done it. <laughs> I want to make sure that doesn't happen. I think I have a responsibility to our customers, our employees, and, uh, and to the foundation who gets all the money uh, to, to make sure the, the company goes on. But I'll leave you with a thought. Uh, when I got elected, um, the press wanted to write a story after 100 days in office. They always write the 100-day story, mm -hmm. and everybody's got to, every reporter's got to have a different one. And so they kept asking me, all right, up to 100 days now, what did you do? And I said, well, I built a team. And they said, yeah, that's nice, but what did you do? I said, no, no, you don't understand. I built a team. I could not get the concept through to them that the most important thing I could do in the first 100 days would be to put together the people who were going to work in that administration, hopefully for the first four years that I was elected for. Truth of the matter is, most of that team stayed with me for all 12 years that I was in office, and they were the ones that did the work. What I did is I brought them in, care and feeding, and an occasional pat on the back and that sort of thing, but delegate to them, and we put together a team that was really expert in every single of the fields. We, didn't, we made some mistakes, don't get me wrong. I, if I would do a few things differently if I had to do it all over again. But we had the right people who were experienced and authorized to go and find good ideas from themselves or others and then implement them. And I don't think it's fair to say that by the time I got done, people were happy. When I first got into office, a year after in office, I stood up and I said, we're going to raise taxes dramatically. And you would have thought the world ended. Uh, Kevin Sheiky thinks that I, my polls went down, not to the lowest of a mayor in New York City, but to the lowest of a mayor any place in the world. <laughs> Two years later, I won going away and run two more terms, even though I was only authorized to have one more term after that. And today, people would go back and say, you did a great job. And it's really the administration. They were the ones that did a great job, so thank you. Well, on, be on behalf of everyone here, Mayor, I just want to say thank you for your great service, not just to New York City, which we all love New York City and the great work that you did there, but to our nation and your continued commitment to making us a better country. Well, we're, you're nice to say so, and thank you for, for your it. service. No, thank you. Thank you.